It's Mentor Jeweler Joel McFadden, and I want to apologize. This is one of the longest videos I've done to date. It's a little over 30 minutes, but I think that's a testament to how much work you really do need to put into polishing and finishing the rings. I'm going to touch on a lot of techniques. Uh, bear with me and go through the whole video. I think you'll learn a whole lot, and thank you for watching. Hi, it's Mentor Jeweler Joel McFadden, and today I'm going to talk about cleaning up this casting. This is a ring that we designed recently. It's 18 karat yellow gold, and we just got it back from the caster. So I'm gonna show you how I clean this up and the process that we go to to polish it. Um, this is gonna be a slightly abbreviated, but we'll show you the steps. And we're all gonna do everything at the bench because I know a lot of folks out there don't have the high-tech big polishing machines. So we're gonna do, talk about here. So the first thing I wanna talk about is, you know, metal preservation so the first thing that i usually do when i start cleaning up at the bench is i clean up my lap pan and a lot of people leave a lot of stuff in the lap pan here so i think that you should clean up your lap pan save your sweeps and this way when i'm done working on this 18 karat ring i'll sweep it up again and then we can um, send those off to the refiner so the first thing that I always do when we get a casting in is we check the size. This is supposed to be a size seven and it's just a little bit off. It's a size six and three quarters plus a little bit. So the first thing I do is I'm gonna tap it. Now, if you look right here, you can see these are our feeder sprues. And if there's any place on the, on the uh, casting that's going to have porosity it's probably going to be under the feeder screws so right now by tapping it up i'm compressing this area and also i'll be closing up any porosity that might be in that feeder screw so that's why we do it this way but i think a big mistake a lot of people make is they start right off the bat polishing and cleaning a ring and they don't check the ring size. And I'm using a metal hammer. So one of the things I wanna do is, here's my line, my seven. I wanna come right to it, but not quite perfectly on the size seven after tapping it up because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean and polish the inside and make sure that the ring is the right size right off the bat. Um, big mistake I think a lot of people make is they get excited about polishing the outside and then they have to possibly tweak the inside because of shrinkage or just a wax deformity and then they have to go and redo the outside again. So one of my favorite tools to use at the bench are rotary files and I've got several different ones here um, they're different grits you know more aggressive to less aggressive and a lot of times this is what I will start with on the inside of rings these are also the same rotary tools that I use for wax carving so this is a pretty clean mounting so I'm going to start with one of my finer ones and just chuck it up and I've lost my foot pedal. <laughs> I've actually lost my foot pedal. Excuse me. So we're just gonna take this rotary file and this casting was tumbled by the caster. So it's pretty darn clean. But we're just gonna go in here and then we're gonna just slightly bevel the inside edge because nobody likes those hard edges. You can see right here, just a little bit of a bevel there. And this is just quick. A lot of the things that I do are about speed because often I've been in a circumstance where it's all about how many pieces we can produce and how much time. Now, this is a little Valorb uh, rotary, uh, half round buff file. What I'll do is I'll just put that bevel on there. You can see I'm, I'm going at a 45 degree angle and I just want to just 
put a nice bevel on there because you don't want your ring edges to be sharp to the customer. And I'll give you a funny story because I've decided to add some good stories. I used to run a design competition for in-store magazine called Ultimate Design Competition. And one of the aspects of this competition, one of the things that the pieces were judged on was wearability. So the, the uh, designers had to actually build the rings. We panned, pared it down to, I believe, 10 rings. And I remember that we had one ring that was a contender for winning. And one of the judges put the ring on and it literally cut her finger enough that she actually was bleeding a little bit and we decided that that pretty much blew that can you imagine custom making a ring for somebody and they put it on and it cuts their finger so he didn't win that competition so make sure you think about things like that when you're working so now we're going to go back to the outside of the ring and we're going to use a heatless mizzy wheel so we use these i use these mandrels a lot and generally what I do is I grab the mandrel, and that's what these are called. These are just screw-on mandrels. I just grab the mandrels with a pair of parallel pliers. And I like to use the size that fits in my quick, quick change. So what we're using first are called heatless Mizzy wheels. And you can see here what they are. And these are little tiny grinding wheels. One inch diameter, one inch inch thick. You can go quarter inch thick if you want. But um, I love these. These are terrific for shaping and grinding uh, if you've got to do some shaping of metal. So they're similar to a large grinding wheel, but they sit here. Now they do fly up, so make sure you've got some eye protection. Make sure you've got something over you. you pull your lap trans tray out so we catch as much of this and what we're going to do now is we're going to take off this uh, sprue and here's something I do that I don't usually even think about I just do it I keep my finger here because one of the things I don't want to do is heat this ring and let it cool and heat it and let it cool because that's going to harden it so when I get to the point where it's hot on my finger i back off and let the ring cool just a little bit if i'm in a big hurry i'll get some water and just dip it in water but typically i'll just like just go let it cool a second let it cool a second switch to the other side Be patient with it. All right, so this is about where we want it to be. We've ground it down, but I don't grind it all the way. I grind it so that it just lifts up just a little bit above it. So I'm taking the bulk of the metal away but the reason I don't want to continue grinding all the way down is because I want to blend these surfaces. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a file and I'm going to start in the middle and file out until these surfaces start to blend. And you'll notice I'm only filing one way and I keep my finger on the file um, just because that seems to be work the best for me. We want to try to be as flat as possible. You don't want to go back and forth. You just want to go one direction. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking to see the end here start to blend in. Because when we're using the hammer and the grinding Mizzy wheel and some of the other tools, we're shaping. Now what we're doing is blending. And what's going to happen is this little area right right here is going to start to disappear. The delineation between where the sprue was 
and where the ring goes disappears or blends away. So we're going to go one side and then we're going to flip it over and go the other side. And you hear the train whistle in the background. We've got the doors open. It's a beautiful day even though it's January. Coming up on my birthday. Alright, so that's pretty good. Still a little bit there. And of course we have a lot of detail work here. And we've got some edges here we want to work with. Now, I go immediately to rotary tools at this point. But I know that I've got 47 years of doing this. So for me, I've got a lot of control. If you don't have a lot of control, one of the next steps is to go to a sanding disc. Um, if you want to do things careful and slow, especially on flat surfaces, sanding discs are great. And a little tip is, I make a lot of sanding discs by buying these cheap rulers and just wrapping the sandpaper around them and putting a piece of tape on them. And we use, you know, different color sandpapers for doing different things. And you can get a pretty darn good finish with some of the sandpaper on these rings. So when you get a flat area like here, this would work really well. It's going to take some time, but that's a great tip. So we're going to switch to my favorite abrasive, which is Kratex. Oh, yes, Kratex smells bad, but it is the best abrasive I have ever found for working with jewelry, and I've been using it forever. So we get this from uh, Guess When. I lost my screw top. There we go. So I get these in the smaller round square size. And again, this is smoothing and blending. And the Kratex is quick and it does a fantastic job. The thing we're going to do with the Kratex is we're going to do the inside where we had that rotary file and clean this up. And then we're gonna do this little bevel here that we worked on with that file. The reason I like the Kratex is it's aggressive like a file, um, but the rubberized component itself tends to keep its shape and not wear out too fast. A lot of these abrasives wear out very, very quickly. Now I'm going to hit this inside here on the outside because I really want all these. While I want a lot of these surfaces to be really nice and flat, I want the corners to be beveled and smooth. So this is perfect for that. And now we're going to take this, this is perfect for the last blend here. And you see I'm using my thumb as a guide. And I just go back and forth. And you can see right there, it's really starting to clean this up. So here you can see on the top, this is the one that we filed. We haven't blended everything. And on the bottom, this is the one that we've blended with the Kratex wheel. So now I'm going to go in and blend this one. And I, I think that when you're polishing at the bench, it's the time that you spend doing the blending that's really important. And I think a lot of people don't do this properly. I think the biggest mistake I see a lot of jewelers make, professionals and amateurs alike, is they jump right to polishing compounds. And... You know, when you've got those big buffing machines and split laps and things like that, that's really wonderful. But when you're working with bench tools, you really need to spend your time blending and softening everything, but keeping your lines crisp. 
Now we're going to move on to my favorite wheels, and I like to use these knife edge greens and grays and pinks. We're going to start with the green wheel. And the reason I like this is because when I've got these flat surfaces, I can run it up the surface. You can see we've got a little bit of lines in here. Okay. So I need to get rid of those before I try to actually polish anything. So if you see, this blends so nicely. You can see the difference right here. Just carefully blending out all these little ripples and ruffles and trying to get as smooth as possible and try to get an even finish. Now you've got the tumbled finish, which is kind of bright and shiny, but it's not even. So we actually have to go backwards a little bit and get this finish on it. And you'll notice I'm using either the bottom or the top. You can use the top too to go this way. I like to use the bottom side because I can see as I pull it away and I can go right up to the edges. One of the things that I think that jewelers need to consider when they're polishing, especially at the bench, is optics. Because for one, you need to protect your eyes. So safety glasses are great, but you really should be using reading glasses, an optivisor, or maybe even a microscope. I'm probably going to switch to using a microscope in a second. But one of the big things is, is that if you get a finish that looks really good under optic magnified view, it's going to look fantastic to the naked eye. And that is our goal. The nice thing about these pumice wheels is they have two advantages over going directly to compound. And that is I can see what my finish is because I'm not leaving compound residue on the ring. And um, two is they keep this really nice shape so I don't soften too many of the lines in the piece. So like I have to work here and because it's got a knife edge on it I can go right in there and get a nice finish. I can roll right around here and I'm not dulling things. I'm not dulling or losing detail in the ring. You know again this side we need to do we can slide this back and forth by using the bottom side of the wheel I can get a nice blended finish on here and get this ready to get completely polished. And then we'll blend over where we craytexed. Now here's a spot right here we can get into that these will do that a lot of polishers won't get into at all. And this little space right here between these two little details we can polish in there. using this pumice wheel my green greeny pumice wheel i want to go over the surface that's right here and get the little microscopic ridge lines out of it but i don't want to hit i don't want to be hitting those uh milligrams because i want them nice and crisp down here alrighty this is looking pretty good probably doesn't look a lot that different but to me it does so the next one we're going to go to is we're going to go to a gray wheel which is finer we're going to do the same thing with that and you'll see it's going to put even a shinier surface on here
Now that we've gone over the entire ring with uh, the two abrasives and we've blended everything, gotten most of the lines out of it and all that kind of stuff, we're going to go put everything in the Sonic and get all those rough abrasives off the ring. And then we're going to move forward with actually polishing it. So that's going to be the next step. Give me just a second to get this clean and we'll get to it. So we've blended everything on the ring. Uh, it's the shape we want. We've gotten the sprue. It's the size we need it to be. And everything's ready to go to polish it. All the rippling and the rough effect is off of it. We did all those with files and abrasives. And I feel like that's probably the step that a lot of people skip. They file it and then go immediately to the polishing compounds. Well, if you can see, this ring is nice and crisp. Most of the edges are flat, um, slightly beveled where they're supposed to be, but we don't have rippling and stuff like that in there. So here's a stone we're going to be putting in there. We got this from Clay Zava at Zava Creations. He cut it himself. The amethyst itself is from Georgia in the United States. And uh, I don't know who mined it, but Clay got a hold of it and cut it, and I think it's really beautiful. And my customer wanted a, a, a nice 18 karat yellow gold mounting for this. So here's the design we came up with. We did it in CAD and we had it 3D printed, and uh, that's what I'm working on today. I think it's going to look really nice. So let's get back to working on this. Um, 20 years ago when I was in the jewelry industry, everybody used Red Rouge and Tripoli. And I think Red Rouge is just a miserable compound. It leaves black dust everywhere. It gets on your hands, it gets on your face. It does a decent job of polishing, but it takes forever to get it off the ring. It clogs up your ultrasonic. It makes you use two and three times as much ultrasonic solution. And you inhale it. I mean, I remember that if I worked too long in the polishing area, um, I would choke and cough up black stuff, and that was the Red Rouge. So we use two compounds that are much more modern. And the big advantage of these two compounds is they do a very, very good job, but they're also heavier than air. So they don't get airborne like what we're used to. And I think when we're working at the bench, that's really, really important that you're using compounds that don't get airborne. So we used, um, mostly we use a lot of brushes. We use some little wheels here. The first compound that I like to use is Gray Star. And the reason I like Gray Star is it replaces Tripoli. It cuts a little bit more than Tripoli does, but it's fantastic for sticking to the wheels. Now this is what the wheels look like when they come in. They're just like the little buffs. They're cotton mini buffs. And they're just like the little buffs that you would use on your larger polishing machine, but we're going to use them at the desk here. So here's one that I've been using for a while. And another thing is you don't need to put too much compound on here. You need to let the compound work. All right. And remember, never put your finger through here. Never hold the ring in a way that it can, can grab your finger and hurt you. If, if the buffing wheel catches, you want the ring to fly. It's better than tearing up your hand. So we're going to go over our flat surfaces with this. And it's going to take a few minutes. I'll probably spend 30 minutes doing this. And you don't want to push too hard and deform this. You want to let the edges of the buff work. I just add a little compound every now and then. And you don't want to get so much compound that you get this layer of it in here. Because then you actually stop polishing the metal. So we're going to go all over it. If we can get on the inside, we want to do the inside with these. And again, as you're working with these wheels, you are going to be softening all the edges and losing some of the detail. So don't rely so much on these wheels. Try to get more and more of the work done before you get to this point. The next wheel we're going to use is this one. I like to use the soft bristle brushes. 
Uh, this is a one inch. And I like the soft ones. I don't like the medium ones or the hard ones because the soft ones hold the compound really well. Whereas the medium ones and the, and the stiffer ones don't seem to. Now this is exactly what you want to be using across this detail here and in here. And you want to not deform. You want to use the tips of the brushes, the, the tips of the hairs. And just let it take your time and let it do its thing. Okay, so I just finished going over everything with the Gray Star, and I spent some time on it. And what you want to look for is the Gray Star. I haven't cleaned it. The Gray Star itself is still on it. But what we're looking for is that everything is blended. And one of the great ways to do this is to look in the light and see how is the light reflecting off this piece. You know, you've got a little material in here, and that, but that's what I want to see. A lot of people put too much compound. And they end up with getting a, a ring that's completely covered in black. You really just want to see the metal. And looking at it in the light is a great way to see if your surfaces are nice and shiny and straight. So once you've gotten through the gray star, um, you've shaped it. That's the shape it's going to be. The next step with the blue or whatever finishing compound you're going to use is just going to make it shiny and bright. It's not going to change the shape at all. So it's important to know that whatever shape you want the rings, the surfaces and all to be, that's the way they should be. So here's our mounting. It's all cleaned up now. All the compound is, is off of it. One of the things I want to stress is you cannot mix these compounds. If you mix the compounds, then you're by default going to the more aggressive compound. It's very important that you completely clean the ring between the gray star and the blue or whatever your compound is. And another thing is you don't use the same wheels. You want to absolutely start with new wheels and not mix things. Okay. So now we're going to go in with the blue. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use these little bristle brushes that we were talking about. And this is a new, these are new brushes. So it's throwing a lot of stuff around, but it isn't that bad. So you want to get it to where there's just a little bit of blue color on the edge of the edge of the wheels there. Oops. And then we're going to take this into all our little detailed areas and start polishing. And you can see we're getting nice and shiny. Right here, I probably re need to touch that back up with the gray star. When I'm not filming, I'll go back and I'll do that when I can focus a little bit more. So we want to go over everything with this blue. This is a great wheel to do it with. It is a little messy, but it does blow right away. And then I'll actually polish in here too, even though we're going to go in here and cut the seat. We're going to make this as shiny as we can. And especially here, where we've got this milligrainy detail, we want to only use the, the edges of the brush, just the tips. We don't want to press in because that will burn away detail. So we'll use this. I'll probably spend 20 minutes going over the whole wheel with this. Another brush that we'll use a lot are these end brushes. Again, they're just the soft bristles. We use these a lot. These will get into inside the head, places like this. And get in here. And then I've got a brand new felt cotton wheel here, and we'll true this up. This is cotton flying off of it, which is pretty common. 
You can see a little bit of the blue compound here. That's all we really need. And you can see on the bottom of the shank here where I've been focusing for this class, stick a little piece of cotton there. You can see we're getting a really, really nice clean surface. This surface right here is really good. All right, so I'm going to spend about another 15 or 20 minutes with this. I'm going to do some detail work on this when I'm not on camera because it's just... Some, I'm sorry, sometimes it's hard to focus on talking to you guys and doing my work too. But I want to say, if you're going to start polishing at the bench, there, there is one thing that I think you really need to spend some money on that, and that is an ultrasonic cleaner. So we use just a good ultrasonic cleaner, and it's so important that you keep it clean and you use it. We've got a nice little rack in here. You've got to get these compounds off of here between, and we use... We buy our, our cleaning stuff in, in large jugs, and they last us several months. And uh, yeah, this is what we use. And, and ultrasonic is an invaluable tool for a jewelry shop. And I would say even before you buy the big buffing machines and the big polishing machines, buy yourself an ultrasonic cleaner. You know, it's probably the best $200, $300 you'll spend. All right. Thanks for watching and I'll come back with the finished piece in just a few minutes. So here's our finished piece. I think it really came out great. We should be setting a stone sometime this week. I'll post on social media some video of the finished piece. Maybe I'll put a video on YouTube and thank you for watching. Uh, I know this was a long video, but thanks for bearing with it.